Hi, I'm Alex Paul with Open Systems Media and Embedded Computing Design, and I'm here at the uh, Things Conference in Amsterdam with Alistair Fulton. He's VP and GM of Semtech. Now, Alistair, I'm really glad you have the time, especially in a busy show like this, to talk to me. I appreciate You're it. You're welcome. Now, I, no, I normally ask, how, did you get, how does the company get involved in LoRa and all, but you're part of LoRa, you're LoRa. What can we say about that? So you can tell me a little bit maybe about the beginning of that. Yeah, sure. I mean, I came, uh, I joined uh, Semtech about a year ago, um, and I spent the last 10 years building IoT cloud platforms. So I spent uh, eight years at Microsoft and, and the last two years building an industrial IoT platform for Hitachi, and before that, you know, solution development, et cetera. Um, and I came to Laura. I mean, Semtech, as you say, has been has been in Laura for a while. Uh, I came to Laura because I built so many solutions and spent more time trying to figure out how to connect devices than I spent figuring out what to do with the data when I generated it. And I think that's a universal issue in IoT that's held up. I mean, it's held up the progression of everything that we're building and the value that we can deliver. It's too damn hard. Uh, and so I see in Laura the opportunity to provide a simple, low cost highly efficient connectivity methodology so developers can get on with doing what they should be doing, which is building solutions to the problems their customers have and not worrying about endpoints, not worrying about data, not worrying about how it gets there. Well, that's an excellent point, Alistair, because uh, one of the trends that I've been noticing over the years is the agnosticism of hardware, as mm -hmm. it were. You know, it's getting to the point now, and I think in the LoRa community is one of the things that are places that are really emphasizing it, mm -hmm. but it is a trend throughout the entire industry. Yeah. But the fact that we have generic devices, the yep. fact that you put the word generic in an engineering product, yep. tells you that enough we're moving into a hardware agnostic world. It does, and I think the, um, well there is a couple of ways of looking at the, the generic hardware that you see emerging in Laura. I think it's, it's uh, 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 one of the things that's been missing, um, or one of the hurdles I should say that's, that's, that's not been solved until very recently is most IoT projects start with figuring out how to design custom hardware which is precisely the wrong place to start. And it's the hardest bit. I mean, hardware is hard, we always joke. But, but making developers figure out how to build an endpoint from transceiver up is just the wrong approach. And I think that, that you know, while you know, that's our business, our business is to produce tools that are easy to use. And that means, in many ways, abstracting that hardware layer away, because you need to, developers want a simple development service that they can, can work on. They don't want to figure out how. They don't want to figure out how to optimize. They want that just to be handled in the background. I think the generic node uh, that TTN launched yesterday and similar products from Bosch, et cetera, is, is a slightly different thing. That's providing developers not only with an abstraction layer from the actual hardware, it's also providing them with a, a, an endpoint that they can build with without making decisions about exactly what power do I need and what sensors do I need. But most importantly of all, it's providing a path through to production. So I think if you start with a, with a flexible developer board, but then you have to stop when you've got through your POC stage, throw it all away and start again, you solved a problem part of the way, but then you left people high and dry. And I think the generic node has said, Bosch is XDK, and there are a number of other similar products. That offers both flexibility during the early stages of development, but it also provides a path through to production. And I think that's just critical. If, if solution providers are going to be able to get their customer return within 12 months, which I think in many use cases for IoT is the goal, because it's about efficiency, about cost saving. And you try talking to a CFO and saying, money now, cost now, return two years or so. It's a very short conversation. So our, our solution providers have to be able to confidently deliver value within 12 months, and abstracting away hardware and providing flexibility through a generic type, type platform, I think that's just essential. Well, I agree with you there, Alistair, although, I mean, there always needs to be some hardware, obviously, yeah. but the hardware between convergence of functionality and the commoditization mm -hmm. of the core technologies, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's TI, microchip, there are microcontrollers now, the difference between the best microcontroller today and the worst microcontroller today mm -hmm. is closer than it was, I mean, than, than in history, I yes. mean, you think about it. Yes. So you, you partially answered the question, I think, but I wanted to follow up a little bit. Mm -hmm. How does a hardware company like Semtech cope in a hardware agnostic world? It's easy, I think the, um, with LoRa, 
I think partly you know, the, the, the role that Semtech has is to just dramatically simplify development. And I think um, one of the advantages that we have in LoRaWAN as a whole is we're, I mean, we're a big ecosystem, but we're also quite a simple ecosystem. You know, the Laura Alliance functions extraordinarily well. I mean, I've been involved in many standards processes and other wireless technologies, and they're quite painful. Um, so I think that, that you know, yeah, we want to move towards a hardware agnostic world, but the way that you do that is by building incredibly efficient hardware and then abstracting away and providing a simple development surface for, for developers to work with. Very good point. Well, because the cost, you could almost say that the hardware is almost becoming a non-cost factor in some senses, because mm -hmm. we've got companies now that have got satellites mm -hmm. in orbit. 20 years ago, yeah, right, there's, there's a sample of one hanging over there, but. 20 years ago, if you told somebody, yeah, I want to put five pounds in orbit, they, it, the costs are exorbitant. I know. So for all intents and purposes, the cost of putting a microsatellite in orbit today is essentially free. Yeah. When you think about the cost of the services and the software outweigh the value yeah. of the electronics in orbit. I think they toss it out the window as you fly up to deliver the big payloads. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, delivering a, a low Earth orbit satellite for, I think the lowest cost I've ever seen quoted is about 10,000 US, which is just mind bending, it really is. Um, and you can carpet the world with LoRa for 150 of those satellites, and the range that they're achieving is up to 1,800 miles from endpoint to, I mean. And the satellite's only 300 miles up. Exactly, so. exactly, and I think that's, that's, a, a, that's an incredible uh, innovation. Um, yeah, I think the other thing around um, the cost of hardware is it comes down to cost of ownership you know, from a solution perspective, but in the development process, it's cost of development. And I think rather than, than, when you look at the individual components in and of themselves, you're right, that price is getting lower, it's going to get lower, it's going to keep on going down. But if that hardware is extraordinarily complex to use, it costs, you know, I don't know, let's say $50 an hour, $100 an hour for a good developer. If you're burning weeks of development time because the hardware is complex to deal with, the cost of the hardware is irrelevant. What you're focused on is the fact that it took me six months to build a solution. We as an industry, I think, have to reduce that time dramatically. And again, I think with LoRaWAN, the opportunity that we have as an ecosystem is to do just that. Whereas other technologies that are more established or that serve multiple masters in the form of cellular, you know, it's very difficult for them to focus ruthlessly on that one, one topic. We as an ecosystem are able to do that. I think that's, a, that's the focus. It's, it's cost of development and time to, time to value. Well, and at, at the minimum, I think we could say it's the beginning of the end of proprietary solutions. Yes. A the, the days yes. of a company using a proprietary solution to either A, maintain, maintain market share, or B, retain customers is gone. Well, I think the problem is that it's always been the end of that, and that's why when you look at IoT adoption, you know, my joke has always been, you know, the big hockey stick curve of growth, every year you just change the date line and, and move it out. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming. <laughs> the reason for that is, is, is pure and simple. Customers don't want proprietary solutions. They've not wanted proprietary solutions for the best part of the last decade. I joke that, that when I say, you know, if the last 30 years in technology has taught us anything, it's the customers don't want lock-in. They don't want an end-to-end -end solution that they can't disaggregate. They want to be able to choose multiple suppliers. And I think it, it's incumbent upon all of us to hear that message and to respond to it and to deliver solutions that are compatible, to not make ourselves by design indispensable. Because if we do that, all we're doing is preventing customers from benefiting from the solution that we're providing. I agree with you completely, Alistair. Now, so then, before I let you go, I know you're really busy and you got stuff to do. You've been saying all kinds of interesting stuff. Do you have any last words, something uh, that we haven't covered yet or something you'd like to bring out for um, the audience? I would say, tell us what you need. As a company, uh, Semtech is, is here to provide tools and services and capabilities that make it easier. Um, we spend a lot of time, as I said on stage, talking to customers, talking to the ecosystem, talking to folks in this room to understand. Um, the one thing that I think is certain in, a, in an environment as, as, as diverse as the IoT is that anyone who tells you they know what the answer is is going to be wrong. And uh, one of the things we, we I think, very focused on in Semtech is, you know, we acknowledge that the likelihood of being wrong if we say, you know, we know the pot, it's very high. You know, what we need to do is be very agile to listen to what people are saying, to learn from that, and to, to actually adapt and provide different services. Now, as a silicon provider, one of the challenges of being a silicon provider is it takes a while to build new silicon. And so our ability to iterate and innovate just on hardware alone has been, it's been, it's been tough. 
And so one of the reasons that we're moving to, to make more investments in, in software abstraction and services like our cloud service, it's not because we just change the nature of our company. It's that we recognize that those tools and services make it much, much easier for us to listen, to change, to add new features, to adapt than we have ever been able to do before. So the lasting message I would give is, tell us what you need as an ecosystem. We're here to listen and we're here to take action. Very cool. I'm really glad you had the time to come spend yeah, it welcome. with us. Um, Thanks great a lot. Great pleasure. Thank you.